Well, I'm going to I'm going to get back to design science um, because we're going to get way laid by music. Um, I, I, I'm sure you're thinking about what connects all the tracks you've selected and whether there was an overall design theme. Because if you if you do that, we might we might get a better selection later. That's that's my theory that, that, anyway. That, that's a good, a good a good point really. Uh, you caught me out there, so let's let's try and respond. <laughs> I'm playing for time, um, because I haven't got a single purpose for all the collection of of, of tracks I've, I've got. Um, there there are, I guess there might be three or four um, good accounts for why I chose a collection here and there and why I bridge across from one to the other, and, and just let's have some examples. I think um, with um, jo uh, Janis Joplin, I wanted to, to start with um, One Night Stand, it's raucous, it's, it's um, a bit of a, an entree, and then that leads across to a contrast with um, uh, Joan Armour Trading, um, who, with Rosie, which is a bit of a ballad. Um, can move on to Linear Skinyard, where well, a bit of a now, let me stop and, and so on. So before before we do that, because mm. um, we are jumping about a bit, I want I want to play a, a fairly brief extract, which is about five minutes actually, um, from YouTube. Um, it's called Science Two: uh, Design Science of Collaboration, and um, it's Ben Schneiderman, who uh, was speaking at a Stanford Human Computer Interaction Seminar. Because it seems to me this is another area that design science is coming from, is uh, human interaction with computers, and then particularly websites and apps, the us user experience community. Because um, that they seem to me they have to get into uh, design, and because of the amount of information they've got, it, they they really have to be scientific about it, and that that does seem to be to me to be um, a, another aspect of where design science is coming from. So th th this, um, this, as I say, is an extract. The, the, the whole clip on YouTube is an hour and a half, which is very long for YouTube. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to play it all. Um, it starts out by looking at how uh, the, the human-computer in interaction has worked in various projects, d disaster relief and ver various social uh, situations, um, Wiki, Wikipedia, various various places where these techniques have been effective. So, J JD, would you play the play the extract? All right. So, I think you could probably work on filling in each of these things here. But I caution you: this is only a framework for thinking about it that's derived from the research literature. And the question I'm going to deal with in the remaining time is: okay. You, maybe you agree that these are reasonable conjectures, and how would I go about proving the efficacy of this model and demonstrating that these were successful methods or not, or refining them? And so that's sort of where I'm going with this, this notion of what kind of scientific methods would be appropriate to study that world of collaboration, whether it's disaster response or whether you're into Wikipedia or other kind of uh, social network systems. Okay? So this suggests, and I'm, I guess I'm motivated by the idea of a variety of problems that I mentioned at the opening, like sustainable energy, like healthcare delivery, like uh, fighting terrorism, protecting privacy, secure voting. There's a lot of really complex problems that we care about in this world and they're very difficult to solve. Uh, it requires multiple disciplines. Laboratory studies are of limited value, and the natural sciences and the models that we took from the past are, I would say, limited in their relevance. So just you know, to remind you about the broader aspirations, I mean, why shouldn't we engage our computer science students and colleagues in dealing with issues that I mentioned, or these UN Millennium Development Goals. And I'll read the eight of them uh, just you know, to register the kind of things which I think our technology should be put to work for. Eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Achieve universal primary education. Promote gender equality and empower women. Reduce child mortality. 
improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and develop a global partnership for development. Now, these were agreed to by the nations of the world in the year 2000, and we're more than halfway towards the goal of satisfying these by the year 2015, but sadly, the evidence is progress is not really being made in these areas. So that's quite troubling, and we're in this problem-solving computer science community can we apply our techniques, our skill, our technology to working on these problems? I embed this in this larger historic transformation, and I was very much influenced by a book by John Horgan called The End of Science, Facing the Limits of Knowledge in the Twilight of the Scientific Age. And he talks chapter after chapter, the end of this, the end of that. Uh, physics is often cited that, you know, the last 20 years of string theory haven't really brought the kind of contributions and advances we might expect. And, you know, we see the struggle of computer science in its current incarnation. It's sort of done its job. Moore's Law is a great success, but it's no longer exciting or as exciting as it used to be uh, in terms of the next gigabyte and peta petaflop of, of progress. Um, the sort of transformation historically is the substance of Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History. So these are all sort of big transformational notions. And I was focusing on the narrower one and suggesting that the last wonderful 400 years for natural sciences has done us much service and much of the technology and society we have comes from great contributions in science 1.0. But the reductionist approach and the controlled experiments and laboratory environments and the study of the natural world, while there's still much to be done, uh, it seems like we, we need to make a safe space for a new kind of science. And I called that science 2.0, which dealt with these integrated problems that were not, did not easily rend them, lend themselves to a reductionist approach, and where the method of research was more of interventions or what would be called quasi-experiments. This is what Amazon and Netflix and others had developed as a technique. Make a change to the interface, watch what happens for the next 10,000 users, and then make another change. And many of these small interventions began to give them shall we say, a theory, a model, an understanding of what worked and what didn't work. Now, sometimes it was little things like the size of the pictures of the books or how much text there was or where they put the price or how much of a discount they gave, but they, began, they did hundreds of these. And Amazon did not do a lot of usability testing, but they did a lot of sometimes called A-B testing, and that provided enormous advantage in trying to understand what they were doing. These are situated, they're in the real world, and so that takes a certain courage to intervene. And I suggest this is beyond what typical sociologists and social scientists are usually doing. They tend to want to understand, but are reluctant to intervene. It's kind of the Star Trek's prime directive, which is, you know, don't intervene in the, in the cultures you study. Um, but I think we have to make responsible interventions to be able to understand what might happen in these made world scenarios. So the difference between the natural world and the made world is, I think, an important part. Now, I do want to preserve the good ideas of hypothesis testing. I still think of science 2.0, and the essence of science for me is testing hypotheses and making predictive theories so that we can have a generalizable theory that we might apply in novel circumstances. And the idea that replications should be doable. Now, in the complicated world of social networks, replications are never perfect. But they're never perfect in any of the science studies. There's always somewhat uh, different situations. But if you do a small variation dozens of times and you get similar results, you do begin to build the evidence that says, I know what's going to happen if I make the following interventions. Okay? Now, um... So, that was uh, Ben Schneiderman. And uh, what did you make of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, very interesting. You started off with him um, citing some of the points from the United Nations uh, deliberations, uh, which is a direct 
sort of um, follow on from what Buckminster Fuller um, proclaimed. In fact, just as an aside, Buckminster Fuller was declared Humanist of the Year <laughs> in, the, in, I think it's about 1970. So, um, yes, it, it, there's a complete sort of continuum here. And um, what's just been talked of is, how, on the one hand, how one can bring design science to bear on the human interface with, with um, the technology. And, uh, in fact, he talked about it being the made world as opposed to the natural world. Um, and on, on the, the other hand, he was talking about, um, in the made world, uh, with social networks and these sorts of um, applications. And what came to mind for me was Facebook. He talked about Amazon. Um, how one can actually, in real time, observe what is taking place and make incremental changes and see how that works or doesn't. And, um, and, and then go forward on the basis of, of lessons learned. But it's something rather like lessons learned in real time which is very different from retreating to the lab for a duration, going into deep thought and coming out and trying something, if you see what I mean. There's that difference. Yeah, and I, I guess engineering has been somewhere in between because there's, there's a belief in, in t testing design before committing to production. Yeah, 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 um, indeed. Um, because you have, you have a big launch, don't you? Um, if you think of the automobile industry... <laughs> Um, the car industry. Um, they used to spend, say, five years developing a car, testing it, and then there'd be a big fanfare and it'd be launched. Um, w what's happened over the last 15 years, I think, is that cars have gone into garages for their servicing, and what's actually happened is they've had, um, uh, they call them computer diagnostics on the engine performance and everything else. In fact, what's happened a lot is that the manufacturers of the car, they supply the computers to do the diagnostics, and they find out how that car, amongst all the other models of that car, are behaving. And they pick up the precise lessons about wear and tear um, from the, not just the engines, but the brakes, everything else, and take that back to base. And they then redesign the car. The result is that today, from that incremental lesson learning, today um, the difference in performance between cars is frankly neg negligible in terms of they will last the same length of time, they will perform the same way because of um, uh, speed limits on roads and everything else, they'll perform in the same way and you end, and they look fairly similar as well uh, because of crash testing, the need for a good front end and back end to withstand. All of those things, there's a uniformity coming into play now and so the difference remaining for cars is their looks and perhaps their price. Um, that, yeah, so, so I think design science has come into play in manufacturing and whilst the, the what you just played there about commentary on design science. Um, uh, contrast that with what I was saying about Buckminster Fuller. And although they were just talking now about the, the computer interface with humans, um, it's applied elsewhere in manufacturing as well, just as you say. So are they not doing so much testing before they launch? Is that your guess? Um, they, they have to do testing before launch to, to gain um, license from um, government authorities to be able to put vehicles on the road. Um, but uh, uh, but they, how can one describe it? The the lessons learned in the previous model goes also into a fund of knowledge for cars at large from that that designer, right. and that yes. then is applied to the next model. Right. Okay. And reliability but, and quality is is is. But so if you're thinking through. about um, a website or a social networking approach or a radio program, w when you talk about real time feedback. You're, you're, you're probably talking about a situation where, where people design as they go. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, uh, as your listeners will know, I was fumbling around with these concepts when I first got <laughs> going in this show in today. Um, and I was, I was picking up what the thread was and, and what to talk about. Um, I, I think w when it comes to radio shows, um, w w how does one pick up lessons? How do you get the feedback? If, if you're going to learn lessons with design science, you need to have a feedback loop. How do, you get, how do you get feedback, in, for example, in the Wild Show, um, so that you can learn lessons, apart from the ratings? Which is the the ratings. Yeah. We know when people talk to us. Yeah. You can phone in.